This is the Math 3 Unit 5B review. And uh, the first problem is kind of review section 5.5, five, Rational Exponents. We're to write the expressions in the simplest form and assume all variables represent positive real numbers. So the um, part A, we have 81 x to the 12th to the negative 1 fourth power. Because it's a negative exponent, we're going to make that a positive exponent by rewriting this as 1 over, in parentheses, 81 x to the 12th to the 1 fourth power. Everything in parentheses is to the 1 fourth power, so that means we have 81 to the 1 fourth power, and we have x to the 12 to the 1 fourth power. 81 to the 1 fourth power, that means the fourth root of 81, and x to the 12 to the 1 fourth, in that case we're multiplying exponents, the 12 and the 1 fourth, and we get x to the 12 over 4 power, which reduces. So the fourth root of 81, 81 is 9 times 9, 9 is 3 times 3, and again we got 3 times 3, and so this is the fourth root of 3 to the fourth power, which is 3, times x to the third power, because 12 divided by 4 is 3. So the final answer here is 1 over 3 x to the third. Part B, we have 3 x to the 2 fifths times 3 x to the 3 tenths. That 4, the exponent of 4 is just a 1, the exponent of the 3 is just a 1. So what, what I'm going to do here is multiply 4 times 3 to get 12, and then multiply x to the 2 fifths times x to the 3 tenths. Here the base is the same, it's x, and so to multiply with same base but things that have exponents, we actually add the exponents together. So the base stays the same, we get x, and we're going to add 2 fifths with 3 tenths. So to add fractions, we want a common denominator. The 2 fifths, I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by 2 to get 4 over 10, which is equivalent to 2 fifths, and add that to 3 tenths. So for a final answer, we end up with 12x to the 7 tenths. Part C, we're dividing same bases. So we leave the base alone and we subtract the exponents. So 3 fourths minus 1 eighth. When you're subtracting fractions, you want a common denominator, which in this case will be 8. So I'm going to multiply the 3 and the 4 by 2 to get 6 eighths, which is equivalent to 3 fourths, and subtract from that 1 eighth. So our final answer is x to the 5 eighths. Part D, everything in parentheses is to the one-third power, which one-third power means the cube root, so we can rewrite this as the cube root of 27x to the ninth over 8y to the twelfth. This is equivalent to the cube root of 27x to the ninth. over the cube root of 8y to the 12th. And we can even 
break this up even even further and make this the cube root of 27 times the cube root of x to the ninth times the cube root of 8 times the cube root of y to the 12th. Now you don't have to do this, but it may, if you're not sure what to do, by breaking it up like this, there's smaller pieces to work with individually. Cube root of 27 is 3, because 3 to the third power is 27. The cube root of 8 is 2, because 2 to the third power is 8. And x, the cube root of x to the ninth, if we change that back to fractional exponents, we get x to the nine thirds. And doing something similar with the cube root of y to the twelfth, we get y to the twelve over three. Well, we can reduce those fractions, so we get 3x to the third over 2y to the fourth power. And there we have an answer. The second problem is from section 5.7 on graphing radical equations. We're asked to sketch the graph and find or solve for the indicated information. Part A asks to write the equation for f of x, which is a translation three units up and four units left of g of x, I should say of g of x, which is equal to negative two square root x. So if we start with g of x, which is negative two square root x, and we want to translate three units up, we're going to add a 3 to the end of that. And we want to go 4 units left, so I'm going to add a 4 to the x underneath the square root sign. And that is our equation for f of x. Now we're asked to graph f of x. So in graphing this, um, First of all, looking at the equation, I'm going to graph over here. We were translated three units up and four units left from um, g of x. g of x is, um, is not translated at all. It starts at 0, 0. But from 0, 0, we've been translated up three units left four units, so at negative four, three is a kind of our starting point. And typically our square root function looks like the top half of, of a sideways parabola, but because we have that negative sign in front of the two, it's gonna, we know it's, instead of moving up, it's gonna be dropping down. So I have some sense of its general shape. Um, to get a little more specific, this is eventually going to cross the x-axis and the y-axis. And so I want to find out where that's going to happen. And if we look down in part f, we're asked to find the x and y-intercepts. So I'm going to do that in part f and then go back and finish the graph. For the x-intercept, we plug in 0 for y, and get 0 is equal to negative 2 times the square root of x plus 4 plus 3. Solve for x. So subtract 3. Divide by negative 2. So ne negative divided by negative is positive, so we get positive 3 halves is equal to the square root of x plus 4. Square both sides, and you get 9 over 4, because 3 times 3 and 2 times 2 is 9 over 4, is equal to x plus 4. And then subtract 4. So I'm going to move this over a little bit. We get 9 over 4 
minus 4 is equal to x. Well, 9 over 4, 4 goes into 9 2 times with a remainder of 1. So this is 2.25 minus 4, which is 1.75, negative 1.75. So if I go back to my graph, I know that it's going to cross the y-axis, I'm sorry, the x-axis between negative 1 and negative 2. Now let's look for the y-intercept. For the y-intercept, we plug in 0 for x. So we get y is equal to negative 2 times the square root of 0 plus 4 plus 3, which is negative 2 times the square root of 4 is 2 plus 3, which is negative 4 plus 3, which is negative 1. So my y-intercept, negative 1. So now I have this a little more accurate graph of our square root function. I'm putting an arrow on the right side, stating that it goes forever to the right and forever down. Um, but a closed dot on the far left at negative 4 or 3, because it does not go to the left or above that point. So we have our graph. Part C, finding the domain of that graph. Well, the furthest left for our domain is at negative 4, and it goes as far right as it wants. For the range, the lowest it goes is negative infinity. The highest it goes is 3. Make sure you use the brackets on the negative 4 and 3. Find the open interval where f of x is increasing. Well, as you read this graph from left to right, it's, it's dropping, it's decreasing, so um, this does not increase. So f of x does not increase. In fact, if we were asked to find where it decreases, we'd say f of x decreases over its whole domain, which is negative 4 to infinity. <coughs> e says to find the average rate of change for f from x equals negative 3 to x equals 5. So the, when you read average rate of change, think slope. And slope, what we know about slope is, is the rise over run, or a y value minus another y value gives us the rise, and an x value minus another x value gives us the run. So in this case, we have our x values. So we want to go from negative 3 to 5. And to get our y values, we're going to plug in the x values into our function. So um, our first y value will be f of negative 3 minus our second y value will be f of negative 5. So we need to find out what those y values are and then plug them back into this slope formula. So I'm going to do a little scratch work on the side. f of negative 3, plug a negative 3 in, we get negative 2 square root of negative 3 plus 4 plus 3 which is negative 2 times the square root of 1 plus 3. And that's just going to give us e oh, a 1. And if we plug in f of negative 5, 
we get negative 2 times the square root of negative 5 plus 4. I'm sorry, I'm plugging in a positive 5, not a negative 5. Plus 3, so that's equal to negative 2 square root 9 plus 3, which is negative 2 times 3 plus 3, which is negative 6 plus 3, or negative 3. So now I have values I can use to plug back into my formula. Going back this way to the left, f of negative 3 was 1, minus f of negative 5 was negative 3, so we got a double negative over negative 3 minus 5. Double negative is positive, so that's 1 plus 3, which is 4, over negative 8, or negative 1 half. So negative 1 half is our rate of change from x equals negative 3 to x equals 5. Number three comes from section 5.9, solving and graphing radical equations. We're asked to sketch and graph, sketch the graph and solve for the indicated information. A says given f of x is negative square root x plus 7, and g of x is negative x minus 1 solve the equation f of x equals g of x by graphing. So what we're going to do is graph each function individually and when the graphs cross each other that's when the function values will be the same and we can get our answer. And then in part b we'll solve it algebraically. So I'm going to first graph g of x in green here. g of x is a line. It's got a slope of negative 1 and a y-intercept of negative 1. Um, or we can do this. We can find a couple points. If you have two points that a line goes through, yeah, that works as well. So um, if I let x equal 0 and plug that into g of x, this is for g of x, then I get y is equal to negative 0, which is just 0, minus 1. So y is negative 1. So I know this line goes through the point 0, negative 1, which is our y-intercept. So I'm going to put a point there. And I'm going to now get a second point. Um, I'll plug in x equals 1 into, the, into g. And I end up with y is equal to negative 1 plus, sorry, negative 1 minus 1, which is negative 2. So now I know when x is 1, y is negative 2, and I could plot that point. And then we have a, some sense of what this line looks like. I'll label that g of x. Now f of x, I'm going to use a different color for. I'll use uh, black ink here. And it's a square root function. It's been moved to the left 7 units. That's what that plus 7 is from 0, 0. So I'm going to move left 7 units. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Put a point there. <coughs> and I, um, there's a negative sign in front, so I know this is opening downward. 
And I, I want to know, well, if this continues, where is it going to cross the, the green line, g of x? And so what we can do is plug in x values and hope we get closer and closer and hope we can actually find that. So plugging in and checking. Um, or we can skip down to b for and solve this algebraically and see exactly where they should cross. And I'm going to do that. So f of x is negative square root of x plus 7. g of x is negative x minus 1. And I want to solve for x. First thing I'm going to do is multiply the left side and the right side by negative 1. That changes all of our signs and makes this a positive square root of x plus 7 is equal to positive x minus 1. Second step, I want to get rid of the square root sign, so I'm going to square both sides of the equation. When you square the square root, you end up with um, x plus 7. When you square the right-hand side, you end up with x minus 1 times itself. If you distribute that, we get x squared, this is x times x, minus x, minus x again, plus 1. Um, the two negative x's I can combine, so we get x plus 7 is equal to x squared minus 2x plus 1. I'm going to subtract x and subtract 7 from both sides to make the left side equal to 0. When I subtract x from negative 2x, I get negative 3x. And when I subtract 7 from 1, I get negative 6. Lastly, I'm going to try to factor this. I'm looking for two numbers that multiply and give us negative 6 and add to the sum of negative 3. It doesn't work out here, so I'm going to plug in uh, this. Um, I'm going to use the quadratic formula x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2 times a. Again, this is using the quadratic formula, so if, if something doesn't factor, that's what we need to do. That gives us 3 plus or minus the square root of 9 plus, because negative 4 times negative 6 is positive 24 over 2. Which is 3 plus or minus the square root 9 plus 24 is 33 over 2. I'm going to now use a calculator to get a decimal value here. Um, we have two values, actually, and one with the plus sign, one with the minus sign. So if I type in my calculator 3 plus the square root of 33 divided by 2, I end up with 4.37, and this is a rough... I'm rounding here. Um, if I type in 3 minus the square root of 33 and then divide that by 2, I end up with negative 1.37. So what this is meaning, remember we're solving for where these functions are crossing. <clears throat> 
in our picture. Um, and it's telling us it crosses at two, two places, at 4.37 and at negative 1.37. Only one of them is correct, though. And one of them does not work. If we plug the negative 1.37 back into our original equation that we're using to solve, you'll see that it doesn't work. It's an extraneous solution, and we got to throw that out, leaving 4.37 to be where this crosses. So if we go back to our graph, graph will extend down this way, kind of curve, and they will cross a little off, but they're crossing at x equals 4.37. So between 4 and 5 here, somewhere at 4.37. Number four is taken from section 5.10 on function operations and domain. Um, we're told that f of x is x squared plus 3x minus 10, that g of x is x minus 2, and that h of x is the square root of x. So part a asks us to add f of x and g of x. So I'm going to substitute in. So f of x is x squared plus 3x minus 10. And I'm going to add g of x to that. g of x is x minus 2. So when I add them, I combine like terms, and I have x squared. The 3x plus x is 4x. And negative 10 and negative 2 is negative 12. And that's my answer. B is asking me to divide F over G. So F is X squared plus 3X minus 10. G is X minus 2. We have an uh, algebraic expression over another algebraic expression. Like, and thinking back to what we've done with rational uh, functions, we tried to simplify by factoring. So can we think of two numbers that multiply to negative 10 and add to 3? And it factors to x plus 5 times x minus 2 divided by x minus 2. And uh, the x minus 2 divided by x minus 2 is 1, assuming x is not equal to 2. And so this simplifies to x plus 5. Again, x is not equal to 2 in this problem. C is asking us to subtract. Subtract f from g. So g is x minus 2. And I'm going to subtract. And here it's important to put f in parentheses because we're going to have to distribute that minus sign to all, all of f. So to x squared plus 3x minus 10. So distribute that negative to all three parts, which gives us the subtraction problem. x minus 2 minus x squared minus 3x plus 10. Then combine like terms. We got a negative x squared. We have an x minus 3x, so that's minus 2x. And we have a negative 2 plus 10, so that's plus 8. So negative x squared minus 2x plus 8 is our answer. <coughs> Part D is a composition of two functions, f of h of x. So this is saying, take h of x and plug it inside of f of x. 
So f of x, if I'm going to write f of x out, f of x is x squared plus 3x minus 10. But I want to plug in h of x wherever there's an x. So I'm going to go back and erase my x's. I'm going to put parentheses where those x's were. And instead of putting an x there, I'm going to put h of x there. Well, h of x is square root of x. So I'm going to put a square root of x wherever. That's, that's me plugging in h of x wherever there was an x. And then simplify this. Square root of x squared is x plus 3 square root x minus 10. Part E, composition of function again here. I need to find g of h of 9. So I'm going to use the function g, which is x minus 2. But instead of putting an x there, I'm going to plug in h of 9. So I'll put parentheses there. And I need to find out what h of 9 is, so I'm going to do a little scratch work on the side. I'm going to plug 9 into h, which is the square root of 9, which is 3. And so then I'm going to plug 3 in the parentheses and get 3 minus 2 is 1. The last one in this part. This is asking us to multiply f and g. Not composition of functions, we have the multiplication sign. So f is x squared plus 3x minus 10. And g is x minus 2. So we want to distribute x squared times x and negative 2. three x times x and negative two and negative ten times x and negative two combine like terms and you have your result. Number five uh, comes out of section 511. Part A asks us to draw a function that does not have an inverse function. Well, every function has an inverse, but its inverse may not have a function. Um, so if I draw a parabola, Parabola does not have an inverse function <coughs> over its whole domain. Um, and a quick way to tell is, is use the horizontal line test. If you can draw a horizontal line through more than one part of your graph, then it won't have an inverse function. So B says draw a function that does, does have an inverse function. So something like this will have an inverse function because <coughs> every horizontal line will only pass through it only once. Part C asks us to find the inverse of the square root of x plus 3. And I'm going to change, I'm going to adjust this. Um, let's put a 2 here. So if I want to find the inverse, I'm going to swap x and y. Um, so originally we have x, sorry, we have y is equal to 2. I'm just inserting this 2. I'm changing the problem here 
just to give you a different kind of problem here. I'm putting a 2 there. That's not normally what we would do. But to find the inverse in general, you're going to swap x and y. And so we're going to write x is equal to 2 times the square root of y plus 3. And then we're going to solve <coughs> solve for um, y. So divide by 2. And that's equal to the square root of y plus 3. And then I want to get rid of the square, square roots, so you square both sides. And when you square a fraction, you square the x and you square the 2, and you end up with x squared over 4 is equal to y plus 3. And then you can subtract 3, and you get y is equal to x squared over 4 plus 3. <coughs> That's the same thing as y equals 1 fourth times x squared plus 3. Now let's look at the domain and range of f of x. Um, in considering the domain and range, it might be helpful to graph it. So for part d, I'm going to just get a quick sketch of the graph. So again, f of x is equal to 2 times the square root of x plus 3. Now the x plus 3 translates us from 0, 0, um, our starting point at 0, 0, it's going to translate us left 3 units point there and we're going to open kind of curve up and to the right and it's not an exact graph but it's a, it's a sketch good enough to give us the domain and range so we see that our domain is from 3 including the sorry negative 3 all the way over to infinity and the range the lowest is 0 to infinity. So we, in part C, we found our inverse function, which if you were to graph that, you would have a, um, a parabola. Um, but we need to restrict that parabola. And if we know the domain and range of our function, we can find the domain and range of our inverse function by swapping the domain and range. So the domain of our inverse function is equal to the range of our original function and the range is the same as the domain of the original function. So our, our um, inverse function, using inverse notation here, is really one-fourth x squared plus 3 only for a part of the domain so for x uh, between 0 and infinity so for x greater than or equal to 0 so this part that I am putting a rectangle around is the answer for part C Is the inverse a function? Yes, it is. And that's all we have there.